Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is Pierre Laville, who's the president and CEO of Deep South Resources, uh, a mineral exploration company focused on the uh, exploration and development of quality assets close to infrastructure in stable countries. Um, their expertise is, is uh, at the moment is a copper project in Africa, namely uh, the uh, Nibia. So Pierre has a big background in investment and mining exploration, and has, has been heavily involved in the mining industry, um, especially in, in uh, Namibia over the past 25 years. So has a wealth of knowledge and understanding of the country, um, and is here today to tell us a little bit more about Deep South Resources um, as a mining, uh, and as uh, Libya as a mining jurisdiction. So that's welcome Pierre to the uh, podcast. How you doing, Pierre? Very good. Thanks. Uh, thanks to invite me on your show. I'm no, happy to be and, here. and I appreciate your time as well. So, um, I wonder if you can um, tell us a little bit about about yourself, about your background, um, about your career, um, and for those obviously that that may not know you, um, just uh, obviously how how you developed your career to uh, to what it is today. Yeah. Um, uh, but first, I'm, uh, I'm not a geologist or engineer. My background is finance. I started as a stockbroker and investment banker uh, in Quebec. Uh, and uh, I, I you know, end up uh, very quick to uh, raise money for exploration companies in the north of Quebec, the north of Ontario. Uh, so I slowly developed an expertise in uh, raising funds for exploration projects. And uh, in the mid-90s, I decided to take over management of a junior company that was having a project in Ghana. My main uh, goal at the time was to develop project in Africa. We were not a lot of people in Canada looking to do that at the time. Uh, but through my network, uh, I had a friend at Banque Indo Suez who had introduced me quite a lot when I was a broker, quite a lot of uh, South African investors to open accounts for them. You know, that was before the end of the apartheid and uh, just before the end. And uh, the, uh, so I had a pretty interesting network of people that have made quite a lot of, you know, of their wealth with uh, the mining business in Africa. So through that network, I decided to look to acquire some project. And the first project we acquired finally was in 1996 uh, in Namibia. Uh, it was a diamond operating mine on the beaches of Namibia. So uh, along the coast, uh, the, Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic coast. And we stayed there for about three years. We sold back the project at profit. It was uh, you know, a pretty interesting small, small mine. And uh, I stayed as a, a CEO of uh, two different public companies at the time, in, uh, mainly in the diamond business, but also in some you know, copper projects. Uh, and most of them in Namibia. Uh, so uh, I, I'm active with the uh, Namibian project since 1996. I lived in Namibia for a, a period of three years. My children have started school in Namibia. So I know the country well. I have some, a very good network. And uh, Deep South originally was founded by Namibian, uh, Namibian investors, and there are still quite large investors in the company. Uh, in fact, at the origin, I was the only alien in the room. I was the only foreign investor. <laughs> so... Uh, so yeah, that's it. It's uh, and I raised and you know generated about one hundred million dollars of uh, of uh, f you know exploration expenditure and deals uh, over Namibia and South Africa mainly uh, you know in that period of time for at least the last twenty years. Right. So I wonder if you can just uh, tell us a little bit about the company uh, Deep South Resources, um, a little bit of the history and some of the projects that you're involved in. Yeah. The main project is called the Hybe Copper uh, Exploration Hybe Copper uh, project in the south of Namibia. Uh, it's a, a pretty large deposit, very low grade, and uh, uh, there was there was some situation to uh, take in consideration for the metallurgy. But uh, just to give you some background, Deep South was uh, a Namibian company, private Namibian company that was holding 30% of the project, 70% of the project was held by tech resources between 2008 and 2017. And tech has spent quite a lot of money on the project, but in 2015, 16, they were starting to have, uh, through, you know, after a difficult financial year, they were cutting down their exploration expenditure 
uh, in many places in the world. And uh, that was the only project they were having in Africa. You know, most of their activity is on the Western edges of the Americas, you know, the Andes go, going up to the Rockies. So, uh, and the, uh, uh, so they didn't want to leave the project, but you know, they, they, they were not capable of handling it anymore for at least a certain period of time. So that's where we had some discussion with them and we bought back their 70% interest uh, in the project. And that at that point, they became the largest shareholder of Deep South, which is still the case today. They have 16% of the company uh, management and one director, we are sitting on around 11, 12% of the company. Uh, so, uh, and from May, 2017, we looked at the project in starting to ask ourselves some questions. You know, the it, it's a low grade project. So, our main, our main uh, goal was to see if we were able to find a technology to extract the metal at low cost and low capex. If we were finding that, then we were having a project. Otherwise, it was not sure that we had an economic project. So we looked at different you know, tests that have been done by different companies over the project over time, because it's a license that uh, exists since uh, the mid 1950s. So there's quite a lot of companies that have explored over that. So there, there's a huge database. And uh, we realized that there was some, some kind of heat leaching that have been tested by Mintech in South Africa and by the uh, Witwatersrand uh, University in, uh, in uh, South Africa, which is bio-assisted heat leaching. And uh, it's not a new technology. It exists since over 40 years. It's mainly used by majors in Chile for different types of applications. Some are using it on stockpiles, some others just to, as a complement to on the secondary transition between the oxide and the sulfide. You know, they, so there's, uh, and Codelco uh, is one of the company that use that on most of their projects. Uh, so we looked at that and we were seeing some very, very good uh, recoveries up to 95%. So we decided to do our own test on it. And uh, we came out after a year of tests. It's pretty long, you know, to uh, go over all the tests and comparing that to chloride leaching and to other type of leaching. And we were with the bio leaching getting uh, up to 96% recovery on a one ton sample. So it, it was a pretty decent size uh, uh, test. And uh, from that point on, we decided then to revisit the geology and the grade in the project. And uh, we realized that there was some high grade sections that were controlled by uh, uh, some, some faults and some, uh, some shear zones that have never been really identified. And most of these structures tend to be ver vertical. And that's where you find the highest grade in the, uh, in the project. But the project before was drilled vertically. So when you drill vertical space by 150 meter, you miss quite a lot of that material. Uh, so we've decided to test, you know, do some, uh, some drilling on our own and test these horizon, but in, in doing some inclined drilling and suddenly we were seeing the grades going up very uh, importantly. So we're talking of a project of near 1 billion ton of ore with, with at least 5 billion tons of copper, 5 billion pounds of copper in the ground at the moment. Low grade, but with a good extraction technology and with the capacity of increasing the grade, then suddenly everything was changing. And uh, so we arrive at a point where uh, we were start we were to start we were starting a feasibility study on the project and the Ministry of Mines has decided to not renew our license on the project. So that was a serious setback in June. Uh, now what we had to do after that is following the, the uh, legal side in Namibia, uh, we, uh, we had to apply to the High Court to review the decision of the minister because we have the right to appeal on the decision of, of any official at the Ministry of Mines, but when it's a minister, you have to go to court because there's no one on top of him. You know? uh, so that's what we are in at the moment, a review of the decision of the minister with the court. Uh, the ministry have not been able to provide any documentation showing how they have taken that decision. So it's, it looks like it's a decision that has been taken uh, in the air, very biased decision. And uh, uh, so we, uh, we have recently uh, asked the, uh, the court to stop the court case and render a decision without you know, uh, going further into it because the ministry has not provided any uh, indication on how they came to that decision. You know, no, no technical report, uh, no uh, minutes of a meeting where they discuss the matter and they have some serious 
reason to pull out the uh, the license like this. So uh, so based on that, uh, we believe that we have a good chance to uh, recuperate the uh, you know our rights and. Uh, because we also have some, some Namibians on our board of directors and some Namibians, prominent Namibians that are shareholders, we do quite a lot of lobbying at the moment also to try to resolve that issue out of court if possible. You know, it's like it would be ideal to do that this way. Uh, we were having the right way to develop the project for the first time. The project is there since 50 years and no one has been able to bring it near to a real feasibility study. We were the first one to be at that level. So it's a, you know, it would be beneficial for both the, the country and the company to uh, get back on track and, uh, and move forward with it. The other thing we're doing since, we have started that before that set back with the Ministry of Mines, but uh, we have speed up a little bit more now. Um, we're, we were looking for a second, at least a second uh, copper project uh, because we're really into copper. And uh, we, we, we are near of announcing uh, an agreement that we have done for, uh, that we, will, we should sign very, very soon for a, a very interesting it's copper project. It's, it's less advanced than our hype copper project, uh, but it's extremely well situated, neighboring two major copper mines and uh, very, very well situated on the right geology uh, in, in a, you know, Basically, we're, we're elephant hunters, so we like looking at large tonnage. <laughs> so yeah. we're looking here at, again, you know, potential for large tonnage. So, uh, so that's, our, that's uh, the, uh, the story of Deep South. Okay, so, yeah. uh, um, so obviously, just going back to um, what are the sort of re reasons why the Ministry of Mines uh, are not renewing, uh, obviously, your exploration license? Um, and... Do you think, I mean, are you pretty confident this can be resolved? Yeah. Uh, the, the reason they gave us in, in writing is that we have not done sufficient exploration expenditure on the project, and therefore the, it's not in the best interest of the mineral uh, resource industry in, in Namibia to keep, keep that license with us. Okay. So what we know is that two years ago, the Minister of Mines gave his team a mandate to clean up the exploration license, uh, uh, let's say, system in, uh, in Namibia, because there's a huge percent, very important percentage of license, exploration licenses that nobody works on them. Uh, people are being granted licenses, but they don't have the uh, uh, technical and financial resource to develop that. They just dream of finding another company to sell it and make some money and that, and that does not work so well. So the idea of the minister was to clean that up and not renew most of these licenses that are inactive. So it seems that we felt into the, into the basket of, the, uh, you know, of license to not be renewed. They told us that we were having the, the license since too long and uh, we have not done enough over that period. So, but that's, not relevant in the sense that the minister has the right to renew or not renew the license, but on, he, he needs to have good reasons to do that. It has to be reasonable. And every two years, they renewed the license since many years, where, you know, since the last uh, over 10 years, the license was always renewed on the back that we have done what we have promised to do and we were developing the project. So, and they never, they have always, uh, um, renewed the license without any conditions. So they cannot come back and look at all that period and say, we have not done enough. They were satisfied before. They cannot change their mind like this. You know? So the only period they could look at is the last two years. And the last two years, we, we, we did told them that we were to, uh, uh, to move to a, uh, a pre-feasibility study, do some drilling, and uh, we, we promised to, our budget was, uh, proposed budget was 23.5 million Namibian dollars, which is about uh, $2 million US, okay? And uh, we ended up doing the drilling we have promised to do, not doing a, a, a pre-feasibility study because we have upgraded our PEA instead and started a feasibility study. So we were proposing them, we were moving on more than what we have proposed. And uh, uh, we have ex our, ex our expenditures, audited expenditures that have been audited recently for the last two years were 31.5 million Namibian, so $8 million more than what we have proposed. So you can see that there's a discrepancy before the, between the information we have and that we have provided them and what, what transpires at the minister's office. 
there is so, uh, so I suppose it seems quite fixable, but I suppose you just need a better understanding of exactly what what they require more. That's it. <laughs> and when we have requested that, we have no answer on it. <laughs> so so you're um, still still waiting. Yeah, but now we're trying to do uh, we're trying to have a meeting with the minister. And, and be able to table down what we have done, where we were going, what we were proposing, and, and showing without any doubt that what we were proposing was, was quite innovative, but not new, you know? So, and the big companies will not be innovative like this. They will let the small company be innovative and buy them back you know, when the small company has proven it works. <laughs> so uh, they tend to not take the same risk level than small companies. So that's what the ministry also have to understand. You know, it's like uh, uh, no one will be able to take that project tomorrow and be at the same level where we were, you know, in snapping fingers. It will take three to five years. They will have to do everything again. You know, re-log, re-assay, <laughs> re do some drilling again and so on. You know, it's like uh, so... But so based on all of this, we're pretty confident we can turn the situation around. And uh, we know that there was some people at the ministry, some advisors of the ministry that have probably not provided all the pertinent information to the minister for him to take a, an educated decision. You know, it's like a, they receive tons of report with, with things to sign, you know, so it's very easy to... Uh, go quick over a file and say, nah, these guys have not done anything. So sign at the bottom, you know, and now the minister is a bit stuck with the decision that he has to change. So, but we, we're pretty confident we can arrive to that. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more around, uh, obviously Namibia uh, as a mining jurisdiction, um, and I suppose the opportunities that the country can present to um, yourselves and other mining companies that want to, uh, want to, go into country and, and start mining? Namibia is a very good mining jurisdiction and it's rec recognized all over the industry. Uh, of course, the setback we had recently with uh, Deep South, not because we're a big company, but because we're a public company has made, you know, and made the press and it's known. So it has probably slowed down a bit the appetite of some companies over Namibia, but uh, not so much. In general, it's, uh, uh, it's considered as one of the, you know, number two or three best country to invest in Africa by World Bank, by IMF. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very stable, you know, the, the uh, it's a small population over a large territory. So it's, you know, it, it's, uh, there's not a lot of foyer of, com of conflict there. So it's very stable. The economy is developing pretty well. Uh, of course, mining is a very important part of their, uh, their economy. It's, uh, it's a very large part of their export. I, if I remember right, the last number I've seen 40% of their export is, uh, uh, is mining. So, uh, and they tend to, the system works well. And the justice system is extremely independent of the government and the ministry like this. In that case here, you know, we, we can see it. It's, uh, the court is very, very... Uh, uh, they, they like to protect the independence of the court very much so. And it, it even creates some problems sometime in the sense that many people don't want to discuss out of the court to try to find an, uh, an out of course settlement because they want to protect the, <laughs> just the independence of the system. So that's okay, you know, it shows you the, uh, so it's not a very highly corrupted country also. It's uh, on that side, it's, it's not a major issue. So uh it, it, despite the fact that we had a, a serious setback and now we have a, we have a problem to resolve with the ministry, it, uh, I consider that it's still a very good jurisdiction. And the opportunities are mainly, uh, you will find mainly uranium. Uranium is a very important business in Namibia. Uh, the fifth, if I remember right, the Rossing uranium is the fifth largest uh, uranium mine in, uh, in the world, it's in production since the mid 1970s. So it's uh, and it's still there making profits. So uh, there, there's other, you know, quite interesting uranium play in the country. Gold is also moving forward now. There's a, a number of companies that are uh, finding goals, uh, gold and uh, pretty interesting deposit. There's B2 Gold is producing there. There's a, um, a company called QKR, which is, uh, uh, they've bought back a, a gold mine from uh, Anglo. 
uh, and there's a company called uh, Ozino Exploration that have, uh, or uh, yeah, it's Ozino Exploration that have a pretty interesting project near the QKR project. They are now just, I think they've made a deal with uh, B2 Gold last week on one of their projects. So yeah, gold is now moving forward. Uh, base metal, you tend to find smaller, smaller tonnage projects in general. Uh, copper is smaller, smaller project. Apart, the uh, Hyde Copper project uh, in the south, uh, all the rest is normally smaller tonnage. We're talking about 10, 15 million tons at better grades, you know, up over 1%, uh, as opposed to what we see in the south. In the south, there's two big zinc uh, projects, one that has shut down now because its reserves were depleted, but uh, uh, in the south, there's, there's a potential for large tonnage, uh, large tonnage project. But of course, large tonnage, tonnage in many cases means uh, lower grade. Um, can you explain the strategy of, um, of acquisition of new exploration projects within the country or any other jurisdiction that you're, you're particularly looking at? Uh, at the moment, because of the problem we have with the Ministry of Mines, we, we don't look to make any other acquisition in Namibia. We need to resolve that first. And then after we can, uh, we can decide if we want to continue to expand in, uh, in Namibia. So uh, as we are all specialized in Africa, we have a team specialized in Africa since many, many years. Our main target remains Africa. Uh, for copper, our, our preferred target is Zambia. And that's where we are looking now to make an acquisition. Uh, we, even if copper is very important in DRC, we don't want to touch DRC. It's, it's a difficult country to operate in. There are some companies that do it, you know, are, are doing well, but uh, we prefer not to be involved in there. Uh, we have looked at some project in Canada, in Quebec and BC. We have looked at some project in South America from Ecuador to Chile. And, uh, the prices were, were when the project were very interesting, the, pro, the prices were very uh, you know, to the roof. Uh, so it was not very easy. And the other thing is that we, we will not be able to operate in, in South America, even in Canada, in snapping fingers very quick because we don't have any team on place. And that co comes at a serious cost to establish yourself in the country. Even if we have very good contacts in most of them, uh, we have an African team. We are well established in Namibia and South Africa. So, so it's very easy for us to deploy in any country surrounding you know, Namibia and Zambia and uh, you know, South Africa. So uh, that's why we still continue to focus on that. Would you look at, any other, com would you look at any other commodities in uh, Namibia as you obviously uh, you're pretty experienced in that country? Potentially, we would look at gold, yes, uh, but we really prefer to have copper as main commodity. It can, you know, com copper will always come with other, uh, other commodities, sometime with gold, but uh, as a main commodity, we prefer copper. But if we, if we look at a very interesting project in gold in the country, yes, we could be interested in gold. Um, obviously, your um, obviously expertise is in copper. Um, can you give us your views of the sort of copper market um, for, I suppose, just more recently and for the years um, coming, um, obviously, as we enter a sort of a green revolution? I think copper will remain quite stable for the next year, but will tend to go up for the next at least five years. Uh, I would not be surprised to see now we're a little bit around what $10,000 per ton. I would not be surprised to see it arriving at 15,000 per ton over the next five years, if not more, but I think it's, it's probably in that range. Uh, we know now that the green revolution is in a serious, in seriously need copper, but it's not only the green revolution. Of course, there's the infrastructure plan in the States and in other countries also, uh, but there's also a, a lot of factors like uh, uh, 5G. You need, uh, you need a lot of copper wiring and all these towers and all the systems you have to install. Uh, the data, uh, um, uh, data captures like, like Google and, and others like this are now opening huge farms with, you can see the, the, uh, the um, uh, computers they have in these places. It's completely crazy and they need a lot of copper to wire everything. Uh, it's the same for crypto mining. It's the same for, uh, name it, blockchain. Uh, you, you need a lot of copper for that. So on top of the green revolution and the infrastructure. So it's really in demand 
the demand for copper over the next five to 10 years will, will continue to grow. And the, 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 um, one of the problem we have is that we have not done enough exploration for years. And now there's not enough new project that have been identified to be online as a mining project in the short term, when I say short term, over the next five years to outbalance the, uh, or to compensate for the, uh, the uh, growth and the demand. So there will be a short, there is a shortage of supply and it will remain like this for a certain period. Uh, Pierre Lasson, who uh, I heard an, an interview of him uh, about six months ago, uh, Pierre Lasson, as you may know, is the uh, you know, uh, chair, emeritus chairman of, uh, and founder of uh, Franco Nevada. He's quite well known and he was saying one thing. Copper is the next is the commodity number one for the next 30 to 50 years because without any copper, you don't have any transportation and without any copper, you don't have any communications. And our world at the moment is based on communication and transport. So it's, uh, I think it was a very, uh, it, it's a very important sentence that shows what copper will be for a long period of time. Yeah, and I and I I'm obviously doing a number of different podcasts and speaking about copper. Um, I mean, I've heard obviously the copper demand far outweighs the supply, and I think they need they need sort of one of the big, biggest copper mines uh, to be built every year uh, to to meet up with the demand. And the thing is, the discoveries are not just being made, um, and obviously it takes a long time to put a copper mining into production so we're well behind behind the 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 curve in in copper so um yeah yes. it's 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 interesting to see how it all plays out and um, um and i suppose as a conclusion what's the outlook for deep south resources over the next sort of 12 to 18 months I think the outlook is pretty good because after that setback, of course, our market cap is, uh, has, has turned down to be pretty low. So we still view ourselves as a, a pretty interesting, uh, uh, let's say, target for the next 12 to 18 months. We have some very interesting project that will come in the company pretty soon on which we were, we're pretty convinced that we will build some good added value on it. And if we bring back, if and when we bring back the uh, Namibian project to it, then our market cap will turn around three to five times. You know, it's like uh, we will at least go back where we were before. And on top of that, we will have another another set of assets uh, uh, in copper in the company that that has the potential to uh, big, you know, to be a big discovery. So uh, yeah, we're we're looking ahead for the next 12 to, uh, to 18 months to be quite successful on that side. Yeah, Pierre, really appreciate your time. Really wish you good luck in uh, obviously this um, court decision and hopefully, fingers crossed, and I'll be watching as well, um, that you get obviously these licenses approved so you can uh, sort of kick on with this project. And as we've just said, copper is needed and obviously you've got a relatively large um, project there. Um, so really wish you, uh, wish you well in um, those licenses and hopefully they will get approved. Um, if our audience wants to reach out to you, if they've got any questions, um, how can they go about doing that? And are you on any uh, social media channels? Well, we're on uh, uh, you know, all the social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so, and on the, uh, our website is uh, deepsouthresources.com and we can receive emails from the website or Anyone can send us an email at info at deepsouthresources.com. Uh, and our contact details also are on the website on the contact page. So it's pretty easy to reach us. Yeah. Um, really appreciate the time. Like I said, good luck. Good luck in uh, obviously coming, coming months and the rest of this year. Um, appreciate the audience for, for listening. Um, hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, and, I, and I take it all our audience will wish um, Pierre and Deep South resources good luck in their endeavors for the rest of this year and hopefully they get their their licenses so they can uh, move forward with their projects um appreciate if you can share share this episode amongst your friends family others in the industry um hope you enjoyed this and um continue um continue uh, and i appreciate your continued support with this uh podcast and obviously this particular episode so until next time happy mining <laughs>